Today I'd like to talk to you about 3D disinfection. Certainly any Congress that is being conducted anywhere in the world today, you'll see that there's been enormous emphasis placed on this new frontier. The reason it's considered a new frontier is everything old is new again. What that means is we know from the work of Walter Hess from the 1917 era and the 1920s when he republished his book again on root canal system anatomy. We know from the modern micron CT work that there's significant complex anatomy in these teeth. And so over the years, the goal has always been to eliminate the contents of the root canal system as a source of irritation to the attachment apparatus. And the extraction serves to accomplish this perfectly by removing the entire tooth along with the pulp. And nobody argues about remnants of tissue left behind because they are eliminated with the extraction. In endodontics, we'd like to save the tooth but we'd like to be able to clean into the more inaccessible areas of the root canal system and that's not only possible, it's attainable in today's technology. Let's take a look. So when we look at the breakout on the right, you can more or less see the topics I plan to talk about, so let's get started. Certainly, I'd like to make the distinction between passive versus active dynamic irrigation. When we start to look at teeth, it's a little bit humbling when we look at micro CTs of these teeth and we look at radiographs of finished cases and there's a variety of different histological ways we can assess root canal system anatomy and what we're left with is it's a very dominable, formidable process that we have to achieve to be predictably successful. We have to think about offshoots, anastomoses, furcal canals, lateral canals, and deep divisions. This is the assignment. So when we speak about disinfection, we should all get on the same page. Certainly disinfection would uh, suggest that we've extirpated and debrided all the pulp and its remnants from the root canal system. Certainly the smear layer needs to be eliminated and of course any instrument that engages dentin will leave this byproduct. It's interesting, only a few years ago, uh, there was some debate whether we should leave the smear layer versus remove it. Some people argued that perhaps uh, leaving it was wise because it might block uh, substrates and pathogens from reaching the attachment apparatus. But yet we also knew that the smear layer in the best of worlds was just dentinal mud, but actually the smear layer is usually a cocktail and it's a cocktail of mud, dentinal mud plus pulp remnants. It could even contain microorganisms and their byproducts. And the last thing that has received a lot of uh, emphasis in recent years is not only have we always known bacteria is the cause of endodontic failure, but now we're speaking of biofilms and these are populations of microorganisms that secrete sticky polysaccharides and these polysaccharides are like a moat around a castle. Uh, the polysaccharides protect the actual microorganisms that are the pathogen and it can be formidable to try to eliminate these bacteria and then we know from more recent studies that when populations of microorganisms achieve certain population sizes they will through quark communication split off and a fragment of that society will move and float down a tubule or into a lateral canal and begin to set up residency in another more distant site from the original population. So it has been proposed that these are hard to eradicate with just reagents alone and so there's been a lot of emphasis in endodontic disinfection on how to remove populations of biofilms. There are many, many factors that influence disinfection and I could give an entire lecture pretty much on these various concepts and I haven't even identified a comprehensive list. Certainly uh, most people in academics would want me to include one versus two visit endodontics. That's certainly 
could be argued as a factor that could influence ultimate disinfection potential. So let me tick through the list. I'll say a sentence or two, a few remarks about each one, and then we'll move quickly on. Regarding the anatomy, it's critical that any student of endodontics is intimately familiar with the range of normal anatomy that is noted in the various tooth groups and the various aberrations within the groups. Certainly, if we're going to disinfect, we have to have a complete access. Access cavities must be prepared to include all the orifices in furcated teeth. In other segments that I have talked about, you'll begin to appreciate upon viewing those how the preparation sequence will influence disinfection. Many of us, if not most of us, that are at least my age, were taught to work small sized hand files to length immediately. There was virtually no reagent in the canal because what little reagent was present below the orifice was oftentimes displaced when the file went inside the canal. Oftentimes, uh, the colleague would work those small sized hand files and because there wasn't a reagent present, the byproduct was mud and oftentimes the lateral anatomy was blocked on the first, second, or third instrument. And don't ask sodium hypochlorite to digest dentinal mud. It never has and it never will. What I've advocated in other segments that I've delivered is a sequential glide path preparation where we emphasize pre-enlarging the upper two-thirds first to get unrestricted access into the apical one-third and then once we have access to the apical one-third, then we can think about negotiating that apical third, getting a working length, confirming patency, and verifying that we have a glide path or we don't. When we did have a glide path, we could use mechanical instruments to prepare this region. If we didn't, we had to have manual concepts in mind. Well, certainly the glide path makes a big difference. And what I mean is some colleagues advocate a 10 file only. And the opposite end of that uh, spectrum would be many schools that teach students to in fact use maybe as many as five or six instruments to enlarge the canal sufficiently so that they can have a safer opportunity when they use mechanical instruments to prepare canals. Certainly the more instruments we put below the canals, the more likelihood we are to block, ledge, and transport foramina and we can also have to be concerned uh, that the stiffer files could actually create other iatrogenic events. So a sequential glide path preparation has been shown to be much more effective in disinfecting root canal systems than going to length immediately. Well, when we talk about the shaping files, I'm alluding to perhaps more than 30 plus instrument lines that are available internationally for colleagues to choose from among. All these instruments, uh, they basically have features, but we can take all the instruments in the world and divide them into two different kinds of instruments. We could have two buckets, and we could put all the files in the world into either a bucket called passive instruments or a bucket called active instruments. Passive instruments are more like radio landed instruments, and all the early files like Profiles, GT, GTX, um, Quantec, K3s, these were all radio landed instruments and first generation files. Compare that with an active blade like ProTaper, like Brazzler Sequence, like Hero. Active instruments cut cleaner and don't tend to burnish debris into the tubules and the eccentricities off the rounder parts of canals. So shaping files will influence your ability to disinfect a root canal. Finally, the canal preparation. I say finally because we're talking about file shape. Well, when you prepare a canal, are you keeping the foramen as small as practical? There's that school of camp. And there's another school that also says uh, take the foramen or the terminus part of the canal up to a size minimum 40, preferably a 45 or maybe even a 50. And of course, when we think about canal preparation and we think about moving large diameter instruments, whether they're nitai or stainless steel, into this microanatomy, it's no wonder so many canals have been blocked, ledged, and mutilated uh, trying to reach these unreasonable preparation objectives. So canal preparation 
will be a big factor. I should also talk about not just the diameter at the terminus, but we should also talk about the taper. Many companies only sell 4% and 6% tapered instruments. I've always advocated deep shapes on the order of 9 or 10%. So you can see that we have disagreements regarding the diameter of the terminus and the apical one-third taper, and both of these serve to influence disinfection. We have no agreement on the irrigants. Uh, regarding irrigants, we probably would all agree to some extent that it might be sodium hypochlorite, but what we don't agree on is its strength, the frequency of irrigation, the volume of irrigation, and the ideal optimal temperature of the irrigant itself. We don't have any agreement on the final rinse solutions. Is it EDTA, ethylene diamine tetracetic acid, 17%? Is it BioPure? Is it QMix? Is it Smear Clean? All these different final rinse solutions are now being advocated as a method to enhance disinfection. And of course, there's the devices that actually deliver the reagents. And these irrigation devices can be side port delivery versus in delivery. And again, there are studies by Gulabavala out of the Eastman in London that has shown that even the type of device that you use to dispense the reagent is going to make a difference in how you achieve your disinfection. Passive versus active. Historically, many of us just flooded the pulp chamber with a reagent and it sat there like a big pool and all of our work was conducted through that reservoir. In the modern era, we know that if we can activate and uh, encourage dynamic irrigation, we're going to exchange, the buzzword is exchange solution into the deep lateral anatomy much more predictably than in fact just letting it sit there. And of course, there's a lot of controversy about sonics versus ultrasonics. And what I would like to say is the following. If you're evaluating sonics versus ultrasonics, understand sonics can be done with a flexible, non-cutting polymer tip. Please compare that with ultrasonics, which by definition means you'll use a stainless steel or niobium insert tip. These metal tips are not going to be very conducive in root curvatures. And even though some colleagues and some advocates say that you can use non-instrumental technology, NIT, and you can pre-curve your metal insert tips, I think any of us that actually do endodontics would find this kind of amusing to think that you can literally pre-curve a stainless steel instrument, insert it into a curved root, around the curvature and within a millimeter or two of length and never touch dentin. Because ultimately, the ultrasonic instrument, when it does touch the wall, it's going to produce a byproduct called dentinal mud and the very smear layer we're trying to remove, we're going to be generating. So much can be said about sonics versus ultrasonics, but that would be a quick overview on the various factors that influence disinfection. And of course, I. Uh, mentioned earlier that we didn't even include one versus two visit endodontics. Many of us would argue that that could also affect disinfection. And placing calcium hydroxide and removing it, that could influence your ability to disinfect a root canal system. I want to show you some fascinating work. It's a little glimpse of Frank Paquet's work Frank's a buddy of mine. Frank is at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, and he has done an enormous amount of work in producing micro CT. And I think it's fair to say these are some of the most elegant and eloquent scans I've ever seen. So Frank has shared some of this work with me, but we're talking about disinfection, so I think it's important to say there's not a set of instruments alone that has ever been developed that can clean a root canal system. All files do is shape a canal. Shape canals hold a reservoir of reagent, and it's the reagent that can be activated and exchanged into the deep lateral anatomy. Let's just for fun look at a few of Frank's micro CTs. I don't think there's much to say. 
you can begin to see that our files would have a small, small possibility of even remotely touching all the internal walls of the primary canal, much less the anastomosing and the origination of a third apical portal of exit in that mesial system. Look at these anatomical configurations. Fascinating. And again, it calls for we need to have some ideas with the reagents and some ideas with devices to activate those reagents so we can exchange irrigant into all these various anatomical configurations. Well, what are the methods? There are many, many methods that have rapidly emerged in just the last two years. I mean, starting really in 2009 and forward, most of these have come to market. The thing to ask yourself when you're looking at any particular device, there's three questions that should always be asked, and here they are. Number one, does it actually work? Does the device you're using or choosing to use, does it actually achieve disinfection protocols? Is there science in published peer-reviewed journals that supports any given concept? And then is there collaboration between various universities that justify investing in a particular method? So number one, is there evidence? Number two, is it easy to use? Some of these devices you're looking at are complicated to use because it requires a lot of hands. And some of the joke, the jokes in, with some of the devices are it requires six-handed dentistry. So is it easy to use? And finally, the third thing that should be thought through carefully when you're choosing from among all these various methods is affordability. How much does the device cost to get into the game? That's in general. And then on a per patient basis, what is the single use fee? So you need to have evidence, it needs to be easy to use, and finally it should be effective and cost affordability for your patient and for you. Out of all these devices, and I could give an hour lecture on each one and make it quite interesting, we could compare and contrast each one, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to jump to the one that I just said most closely fulfills the three objectives I identified, and that's the endoactivator. So regardless of your wanting to use the endoactivator, regardless of whether you're using QMix 2-in-1, MTAD, BioPeer, EDTA, it would be great to activate the irrigants so that we can more effectively move those reagents into all aspects of root canal system. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, in this segment, we've looked at what is disinfection. We've looked at the factors that influence disinfection, and of course, the big one here is the anatomy of the human teeth. We looked at the various methods that have emerged in the marketplace to address disinfection, but the main point I want to talk about is whatever you choose to use, use active disinfection because active methods tend to exchange and move your reagents so it can circulate, penetrate, and clean out all aspects of the root canal system. In another segment, I will talk about the endoactivator as a method for using active disinfection.